is time now for Let's Talk College Football. Nothing but college football as we get ready to break down the games for November 17th and November the 19th of 2016. But before we do that, got to go over the Big 12's thumbs up and thumbs down from last week. And we got to give a thumbs up, first of all, to West Virginia, despite the four turnovers and despite being outgained by nearly 200 yards against Texas. West Virginia made the plays when they needed to, and they got stops when they needed to, and their win on the road against the Longhorns. Also, a uh, thumbs up to D.D. Westbrook. Again, another multiple touchdown day uh, for D.D. Might be the best receiver in the country. And in the same game, Jordan Evans, two interceptions, two sacks, first Sooner player ever to do that in the same game. So that tells you a lot. But the history right there, and it tells you a lot about the uh, play of Jordan Evans. OU uh, wins over Baylor. And thumbs down. I'm only going to give one thumbs down this week. You know what it's going to go to? Texas Tech's inability to make an extra point. The fourth time this season that they have missed an extra point. Not a two-pointer, but a one-pointer. How hard is it to kick the ball, twin the uprights from about 20 yards away? That's all you're asking your place kicker to do. And we still have games left to go. Texas Tech has missed four extra points. Their latest miss costed them because they had scored a touchdown late, got to within one point. Looks like we're heading to overtime with about a minute to go. No, we're not because Texas Tech blows an extra point. This time, it costed them in their one-point loss to Oklahoma State. Now, talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly from college football. And no question, it was the day of the dog. That's the good. I've given Iowa a hard time because, let's face it, they have underachieved this season. Not the first time that we've seen that happen under Kirk Ferentz. But Kirk Ferentz finally delivered in a big game. He finally lives up to that big paycheck that Iowa gives him every year. And this time, Iowa was able to hit a field goal in the final seconds and upset previously unbeaten Michigan. And you got to give it to Pittsburgh Remember at the beginning of the season, things didn't look so good for them, and you know they they lose to Oklahoma State early on, and you know you, you think okay Pittsburgh is just barely above 500, not ranked in the top 25. They go to Clemson and win thanks to their place kicker named Blewett, who did not blow it, made the game winning kick, and Pittsburgh stuns Clemson. And I really got to get up to USC. I, I thought that you know Clay Helton was on his way out. They had already lost three games uh, before you know mid-October, and now they are playing like a different team. They go into Seattle and beat previously unbeaten Washington. Fantastic defensive performance by that particular team, USC. It's like night and day, I'll be sure. They look bad in the beginning, but lately, USC has been playing like the USC team of old. And we got to go bad, conversely, to the previous unbeatens, to Clemson. You got to learn how to manage the clock better. Clemson, you got to learn that on fourth and two with the ball at midfield and you leading, you got to learn that it's okay to pump the ball and try to pin the other team deep. They didn't. They got stopped on fourth down thanks to trying to run a sweep play that took forever to develop. Pittsburgh made them pay. And because of that, Pittsburgh was able to only have to march a few yards down the field as opposed to the length of the field, got in position for the game-winning field goal, and for Clemson, yeah, you give Pittsburgh credit for winning, but the Tigers, no question, lost a game that they should have won. And Michigan, the Wolverines, yeah, believing in your press clippings a little bit too much, overlooking Iowa, can't do that in the Big Ten. And Michigan, just like Clemson couldn't do against Pittsburgh, uh, Michigan couldn't put Iowa away in the end, and it costed them dearly. And the Washington Huskies, they've been terrific all season long. They were my pick to win the Pac-12 North. And things were going well. They're undefeated. But at home against USC, Washington did not look like they were ready to play this one. And USC wins the game by double digits. A big shocker. But to me, staying in the Pac-12, the ugly goes to the Oregon Ducks, who didn't even look like they were ready to play at all against Stanford. It looked like Oregon was basically in quicksand, and they were sinking as the game went along. Look, I didn't expect Oregon to win this game. I know they've had a rebuilding year, but so is Stanford. And Stanford looked like they were in late-season form, pulverizing the Oregon Ducks. And Oregon now is assured of having a losing season. 
All right, speaking of losing, that's a thing I know a lot about when it comes to my picks. And this last week, when it looked like I was trending high because I went 4-1 and one the week before, I go 2-3 and three the following week. Yes, I do win the West Virginia game against Texas, and yes, I did pick the Stanford would cover against Oregon, although I didn't think the Stanford would cover quite that easily. Yeah, I believed a little bit too much in the Auburn Kool-Aid. And guess what? I drank it, and I might as well have drunk cyanide because I lost and lost bad. Georgia uh, covers and actually wins the game against the double-digit favorite Auburn Tigers. So I lose that one. I lose the USC-Washington game, and I lose Army-Notre Dame. Of course, um, Army has had a nice year by their standards, but they got blitzed in South Bend against the Fighting Irish, who or having a mediocre year, to say it uh, very kindly. So 2-3 and three last week, overall for the year, 23 wins, 27 losses. I've got three, week, three weeks left of picking. So if I'm to overcome the obstacles and get above 500, it's got to start right now. So here are the five games. We're going to begin with the Thursday night game, Houston at home against Louisville. Houston is a double-digit underdog. In fact, they're a 14-and-a-half-point dog against the Cardinals. Who would have thought that? Back in mid-September when Houston was firing on all cylinders. It's a different Houston team now. But still, it is a primetime game, and it is at Houston. So I think the Cougars will get points in this game and keep it competitive. Give me the Cougars plus the 14 and a half. And then let's look at Saturday where we have four um, double-digit favorites that I'm going to be breaking down, and I like all of them. Okay, Utah minus the 14 at home against Oregon. I think that's too easy. Utah to win. Oregon, I think, is packed the lunch for the season. You have Tennessee at home against Missouri. Speaking of a team that's packed the lunch, the Tigers are just flat-out horrible. Um, Tennessee, yeah, th this may not be the Tennessee teams of Philip Fulmer, but it's still a good Tennessee team, and at home minus 15, I think Tennessee covers with these. And then Nebraska at home against Maryland. Maryland is one of the worst teams I've seen this season. Nebraska giving the Huskers minus a 14 and a half. And finally, the Battle of Los Angeles, which will take place very late. This tells you how much this game has gone downhill in terms of its exposure. It's going to be played very late at night. It's terrific for the Pac-12 for the, for the West Coast because they get an evening game at a decent hour. But for those in East Coast, 1030, our time, 930. Yeah, it's going to be up pretty late. I think USC turns the lights out on UCLA. UCLA, Jim Moore Jr., oh, my gosh. Um, UCLA, what, what's happened to them? Uh, give me the Trojans minus the 13 at UCLA at the Rose Bowl. Those are my picks for the week. A reminder, my post game of Oklahoma, West Virginia, either very late Saturday night, early Sunday morning, I'll have my breakdown of what happened in Morgantown between the Sooners and the Mountaineers. That's my look at Let's Talk College Football. See you next time.